Hello, friends. It is good to be with you this evening for Wednesday Connect and our time of midweek study and prayer. Uh, this will be our last Wednesday Connect of this year, so just make note that the next couple weeks we'll be uh, taking a break as we uh, celebrate Christmas and then the new year. Wednesday Connect is a time each Wednesday when we uh, gather in fellowship and in small groups uh, around our church, and we do that uh, we're doing that virtually right now. We begin with a Zoom fellowship meal at 5.30 and then at 6. We have different studies and groups for all different ages. Um, so I hope you will plan to join with us again when we resume Wednesday Connect in the new year on January 6. As we come to this time of study and prayer, uh, just a reminder that this is not live, but we do want to lift up current prayer concerns. And so if you have a prayer request that you would like shared on the video, you can uh, call the church office with that. You can email me. Um, or if you didn't get a chance to do that uh, before the video was made, you can always just type your prayer request into the comments. And those of us who are here or who watch this video later um, will be able to see that and we'll be able to lift that up and be in prayer for and with you. Here at Jones Memorial, uh, right now, for the health and safety of our congregation and our community, we remain online for worship. And so we have a 1030 a.m. virtual worship service that you can watch via uh, Facebook or YouTube. And you can find that by searching for Jones Memorial United Methodist Church um, in either of those locations. And that will pull up the page uh, for our church where you can find information. I want to let you all know that those of you who currently use our online giving service through Banco, that will be ending at the end of this year. We'll be switching to a new giving platform. There's a lot of instruction uh, or that has instruction that has gone out in a lot of ways about doing that and getting switched over. So please take a minute uh, as you're maybe home uh, this evening or over the weekend uh, to go ahead and get set up, get your gift set up for. Uh, 2021. And um, if you haven't uh, used online giving before, this is an opportunity to try. This is a great uh, platform, Planning Center Giving. Um, you also have the option as a part of that to cover the processing fees associated with that, which is another way to just extend your gift a little bit more um, and save the church a little bit of money. If you want to consider that, I would encourage you to do so. And if you have any questions about making the switch, feel free to call the church office and we'll help you. We uh, want to include you in our worship service each week. We've been through this season of Advent talking about um, the, the characters who surrounded Jesus at the time of his birth. And we're calling this series a nativity because we fill our homes with nativities or creches of these depictions of that, that night when Jesus was born as a part of our Christmas celebration. And so uh, this week we'll be talking about the shepherds and I would invite you to pull the shepherds out of the creches in your homes, take a picture of yourself with those shepherds, post them on our Jones Memorial United Methodist Closed Facebook page, and we will include that as a part of our worship on Sunday. Another great way to see one another um, even as we are physically distanced right now. <clears throat> and finally, we are not having Wednesday Connect next week, but on Thursday, Christmas Eve, we will be having an outdoor Christmas Eve candlelight communion service. Uh, that service will also be live streamed, and if the weather happens to be bad, it will only be live streamed. Uh, but if you go on to our Facebook page, you can see uh, some information about uh, how to be here and uh, to be here safely and participate in that service if you wish to do so. Christmas Eve candlelight communion in the church parking lot at 5 p.m. on December 24th. I hope that we will get to see you there. <clears throat> so as I said, we've been doing this um, uh, study in uh, our worship services looking at the people who surrounded Jesus at the time of his birth, the characters, and what they tell us about what the work that God is doing in the world. And so um, I wanted to reinforce that and dig a little deeper each week in our time of midweek study and prayer. So we've talked about Mary a bit more in depth. Last week we talked about Joseph. Tonight I want to talk a little bit more about the shepherds. I want to delve a bit into the manger itself and also go a little bit into John's gospel, which we're not actually including um, in 
um, the worship service just to talk about the imagery of light and John's telling of the Christmas story. So all this is going to kind of merge together, um, and I'm going to be reading a couple verses, um, one now and one later. I'm going to start with Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. Nearby, shepherds were living in the fields, guarding their sheep at night. The Lord's angel stood before them. The Lord's glory shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. Look, I bring good news to you, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. This is a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel praising God. They said, glory to God in heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. When the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go right now to Bethlehem and see what's happened. Let's confirm that the, what the Lord has revealed to us. They went quickly and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. When they saw this, they reported what they had been told about this child. Everyone who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds told them. Mary committed these things to memory and considered them carefully. The shepherds returned home, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Everything happened just as they had been told. So as I said, during the season of Advent, we're doing this, um, we're taking the opportunity to look at those folks that were surrounding Jesus when he was born. And we're thinking in terms of the creches or the nativities, which we place around our churches and homes at this time of year and the characters that fill those scenes. So um, tonight, um, well, this coming Sunday, so last Sunday we talked about the animals, but I'm not going to go deeper into the animals uh, because actually the Gospels don't tell us of any animals that were there. And instead, I want to focus a bit more on some of the other imagery that are in our nativities. So this coming Sunday, we'll be talking about the shepherds. On Christmas Eve, we'll be thinking about the angels. The Sunday after Christmas, we'll talk about Jesus himself, and then the Magi will follow in the first Sunday of the new year. And so tonight, on our last Wednesday Connect of this year, we're going to reflect a bit more on the shepherd, and in particular, the shepherd's response. So what it means um, that, that the shepherds received uh, this news and how they responded to that. Also, we're going to talk about what it means that the baby Jesus was lying in the manger and why that baby is the light of the world. So as I said, on Sunday, we'll be thinking about the shepherds who first received word of Christ's birth. And we'll be reflecting on the fact that the shepherds were the outcasts of society. And that the angels, the fact that the angels first announced Jesus' birth to these lowly shepherds was a sign of God's expanding kingdom, a kingdom that would be for all people, especially the outcast and the lowly. Uh, so tonight, knowing that about the shepherds themselves, what I want to do tonight is, is talk a bit more about the shepherds' response. So the shepherds had heard from the heavenly messengers that this new king had been born in Bethlehem, that they would find him in a parking garage. That's basically what a stable is, right? Lying in a bed of straw where the animals ate. And I'll talk about that more in a bit. <clears throat> How would the shepherds respond to this news? The heavens open up. There's these angels. They bring this news. Upon hearing this, would the shepherds stay in their fields? Or would they leave their flocks, risk losing their jobs, and hike over the hillsides in Bethlehem in search of the newborn king? Well, scripture, scripture tells us what they did, right? The shepherds went with haste. They went right now, the CEB says, to see the one whose birth would be a source of good news, of great joy for all people. And when the shepherds arrived, they saw with their own eyes what had been told to them. They saw Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And they became themselves God's messengers, God's angels, telling other people about this child. 
This is really important, and that's why I want to talk. I wanted to to look at the shepherd's response tonight, um, because it it demonstrates this rhythm of the Christian life, right? That even now, others tell us about Jesus. We see with our own eyes and we believe, and then we tell others what we have seen. And then we return to our daily lives changed forever and filled with joy. You know, it's Christmas time, and there's a lot of people who typically don't go to church at this time of year, but nevertheless, they're still searching for the good news of great joy for all people. And that might be truer this year than ever before, at least in our lifetimes. You know, these folks um, get to Christmas time and they search in shops and at parties and maybe even sitting in front of a decorated Christmas tree, but they still haven't actually found Christmas. And the thing of it is they won't find Christmas unless someone plays that part of messenger or angel and invites them to come and see, to come and see this child that is wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in the manger. So as we think about the shepherds, I just want to ask this question. Who is God calling you to be a messenger for this Christmas? And you know, I, it's been really difficult not to be able to be in church. But one opportunity that we have is we can offer an invitation to church without it being so complicated. It can just be a simple email or a Facebook message with an attachment on it or a link. Hey, check this out. I think you might really like it. And it could be our, our Christmas Eve service. It could be a, a Sunday morning service. A really easy opportunity to help someone who is searching for Christ, searching for Christmas, uh, to experience that. Um, and, and you can be the messenger. Um, so, so just something to think about as we move towards Christmas next week. Who is God calling you to be a messenger for this Christmas? That's what the shepherds, I think, the example they set for us. So now let's talk about a minute about how the shepherds found Jesus. He was lying in a manger, right? So after Jesus was born, he was wrapped in strips of cloth and placed in a manger. Now, as you know, a manger is a feeding trough from which donkeys and horses and, and other animals would, would eat. Um, and we usually, you know, picture the manger or depict the manger as this kind of wooden construct. Um, but what's interesting is the only examples we have left in the Holy Land from ancient times are actually large stones that have been carved out on the top to hold straw or, or hay. So rather than it being wood, it, it was stone. Um, whatever the case though, uh, probably stone, there was this structure that held food for the animals. And Luke talks about this manger. He mentions the manger three times in just a few verses as he tells this story of Jesus' birth. Um, this is unusual to, to bring something up like that so many times. And I think, um, you know, it should lead us to ask why. Why does Luke mention this three times? Why does Luke feel that it's important to tell us about Jesus' first bed? Well, one reason is obvious. The, the fact that Jesus' first bed was a manger it just reminds us that Jesus' birth was humble. Um, it embodies a, <clears throat> a profoundly moving truth that on his first night on earth, the King of glory, the Son of God, slept in a trough from which animals fed. What a picture, though, of God's desire to identify with the humble and with the lowly and, and with the poor. But I think that Luke actually had even more in mind than just that. I think 
Luke mentions the sign of the manger these three times to communicate the powerful image of Jesus' first bed being the place where God's creatures come to eat. So to think about this on sort of a broader scale, you know, Jesus was born in, in Bethlehem, a town that means house of bread. And John would later describe Jesus multiplying the loaves of bread and saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And so Jesus was, of course, speaking of a spiritual sustenance um, that the world would receive from him. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record Jesus taking bread at the Last Supper and saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Um, the manger, then, the feeding trough, was a sign not only of, of Jesus' humble birth, but also a sign of what Jesus came to do on earth. He came to offer himself as bread for our souls. He came to satisfy a hunger that could not be satisfied any other way. You know, when Jesus was tested in the wilderness at the very beginning of his ministry, right after his baptism, the devil tempted him to turn stones in, into bread, but Jesus responded by quoting uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. You all know this, one does not live by bread alone, and that's, that story is told in Luke uh, chapter 4. But you know, one of our greatest struggles is that we just forget this, right? We come to believe that if we have enough bread, we have enough money, if we have enough stuff, then we'll be satisfied. But here's something I am absolutely certain of. There is nothing you or your family members will open on Christmas morning that will ultimately satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. You know, we see all the time people who who forget this. They find that the cares of the world and the desire for wealth choke out the gospel. They live their lives for more and bigger and better, um, but the more they have, the less they're satisfied. You know, it's, it's like someone with a disease. It just leaves them all always um, uh, um, hungry, and, and though they eat and eat, they are, are never filled, and that can happen with with our spiritual lives too, when we get when we get off track, where we're we're searching for more and more to be satisfied, but there's only one thing that can be satisfied. It's that search for Christmas, where the only true Christmas is in Christ, right? Our hearts hunger to know that we are loved, that our lives have meaning and purpose, that we can be forgiven and find grace, that we are not alone that there is always hope. We hunger to know that even death will not be the end of us. And we hunger for joy and peace and goodness and grace. And all of that exists out there for us. And it's all in Christ. And yet there's this temptation, you know, in this life we re wrestle with this temptation to believe that if we just had more of that stuff, enough bread, we would be happy. Luke, in the sign of the manger, is reminding us that Jesus is the only one who can truly satisfy the hunger of our hearts, which is why Jesus is the light of the world. And that's what I want to talk about next. So, to close out tonight and to close out this year, I'm going to read um, this, uh, the first five verses of John's gospel. And then we'll reflect on that for a minute. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. 
You know, no one really knows when Jesus was born. December 25th was chosen not because, you know, someone had a, uh, a copy of Jesus' birth certificate that, that noted the date and the exact time and the parents' names and everything, but because, you know, as the early church pondered when to celebrate Jesus' birth, the winter solstice seemed like the perfect time. Um, and they chose this time, I believe, not because <clears throat> it was already some pagan festival that others were celebrating, uh, though that was the case, but I think the early Christians settled on this date because on this night, the heavens themselves tell the Christmas story. You know, at the winter solstice, the world seems to change. Up to that day, the nights um, have been growing longer, the days shorter, darkness has been defeating the light, but after, after the winter solstice, the days grow longer and the nights grow shorter. And so light overcomes darkness. So we just heard John's telling of the Christmas story. It's, it's not one that comes into play when we are talking about nativities. It's not one that we will be reflecting on uh, as part of worship uh, this year, but, but it's such a moving and descriptive um, telling of this moment when God came to earth. And, and even though it's not a birth story, we need to realize that John too tells the story of Christmas. He doesn't include shepherds or angels or wise men. He, instead, he says, he tells the story this way. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then a little later he says, what has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. When better to celebrate the one who himself was light, who defeated darkness, than on the winter solstice? And so that's also why we celebrate Christmas each year with the candlelight service. You know, in my adult years, the, the candlelight service is the pinnacle of every Christmas celebration. To me, Christmas would be incomplete without this celebration of God's light bursting into our dark world. Christmas is God's gift to us. It's a gift of light and of life and hope and grace. The gift is a reflection of God's concern for the world and God's desire to heal it and drive away its darkness. The gift of Christmas, then, it also comes with a mission, a calling, a responsibility, and we've talked about that some tonight. Um, you know, being God's messengers, being God's angels, sharing the story with others, sharing our experience with others. But, but on a broader scale, what we're doing is bearing Christ's light in the world by our love. And that's expressed through works of mercy and, and justice and grace and, and acceptance and, and compassion and love and everything. At Christmas, we are invited to receive Christ's light, but not only to receive it, we are also invited to bear that light, to walk into the light and to take that light out into the world. And so I hope we can all find some ways to share Christ's light in the world and in this world right now that seems especially dark. Um, and to do that as we look toward Christmas and think about what it means to truly celebrate Christ. I want to move uh, now into a time of prayer and uh, to lift up with you the people who are um, a part of our congregation that, that need our uh, prayers during this time. A long, long time member of the church, um, Betty Higgins, passed away yesterday and so we want to be in prayer for her family, um, Sally and uh, Barbara especially. and. Um, uh, Betty's other uh, 
children and grandchildren and great grandchildren and those who knew and who loved her and who are now uh, missing her. Uh, let's be in prayer for all those folks. Also, we need to be in prayer for Mark Womack, um, who's been um, kind of on the decline the last several days. Uh, continue to be in prayer for Dwayne and Tina Broom. Uh, for Mar Harriet McCrary, who is at Vanderbilt right now, she had one surgery yesterday and another one today. Um, so keep Harriet in your prayers now as she begins her recovery. Um, also want to be in prayer for Lonnie Broom. That's Dwayne's brother who uh, suffered a stroke this weekend. Um, want to be in prayer for um, Michael and Ruth Put Putnam and their uh, family as they battle COVID. Also, uh, Ashley, James, Maxwell, and Lola uh, Blevins, also they are uh, dealing with COVID, as is Jill Hell's family in Mississippi. I um, want to uh, continue uh, to be in prayer also for Gail uh, Strickland and um, some others to keep in our prayers on an ongoing basis. Liz Jones, Carl Barger, Angel Claxton, Zach Conry, Marlene uh, Gamblin, uh, Margaret Durham, Micah Barbie, Danny McCurdy, Rosemary Moses, Eric Quinn, Carol McDowell, and Janice Jennings. Will you um, now bow with me in a, in a word of prayer? And as we uh, begin this time of prayer, we'll begin with a word of silent prayer. If you have other folks that you would like to lift before God, I invite you to do so during this time. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you as a people who hunger. And we, we try in so many ways to satisfy that hunger and, and find that, that we're never fully there. So my prayer, God, is as we look toward Christmas next week, is that we would remember and experience in the fullest way possible the life and the light that comes in and through Christ. And we might receive him anew this Christmas time and be filled and, and satisfied in the greatest way possible so that we can then be messengers, or bearers of good news to others. And especially, God, we lift to you today all of these that we have named, those have, who have been shared um, in other ways, those who, who are lifted to you um, in our thoughts. God, there's so much need right now, and, and we just ask that in the face of grief, you would bring comfort and solace. We pray for strength for those who are recovering from, um, from surgeries or from, from strokes. We, we pray, God, for healing in the midst of illness and, and sickness. God, we pray for the health and safety of, of our congregation, our, our community, our, our entire world. Um, and God, we ask that where there's there's fear and, and where there's uncertainty, that, that where there's doubt, that your presence would be a mighty force to bring calm and rest and peace to all people everywhere. Help us, O oh God, to be a people who are fed by you and filled by you to be a people who see your presence and your work in the world and who then become the messengers who proclaim your name in every corner so that more and more people in all places will know that Christ the Savior is born. Amen. 
I hope you will join us on Sunday at 10.30 a.m. for our online worship service as we talk more about the shepherds and celebrate the fourth Sunday of Advent. And I also hope you will plan to join us on Christmas Eve, either in person at 5 p.m. in the parking lot or on live stream. Um, we will be excited to join with you uh, in a candlelight communion service. God bless you. Have a great evening.